I want to read for you several passages in the Bible that explain how we are saved. All right, ready? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Luke 7, 50. Romans 10, 13, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, 2. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand, stand by which you are saved. A few more here. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Ephesians 2, 5. Another passage. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Ephesians 2, verse 8. And then corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice all of these things have to do with being saved. And it seems that all of these give a different answer to the same question. How are we saved or by what are we saved? Now it's important to know the answer to this question because salvation is the most important subject in the Bible. It is what the Bible is all about. Everything and everyone in the Bible are part of a single message from God, and that is the saving of mankind from eternal death and suffering to eternal life and joy. That's what the message is all about. That's what the Bible is all about. Now, while other religions focus on perhaps finding some kind of inner peace or harmony in this life, and they may speculate on some kind of spiritual life in the future, the Bible clearly states that our time here is relatively short and our main purpose is not to become comfortable here, but to prepare for the world to come. The Bible says it in this way, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, Colossians 1.13. Now when Peter the apostle preached, he didn't talk about reforming the world. He could have, but he didn't. He didn't talk about seeking social justice. He didn't offer ways of developing a better self-image or how to become more successful using spiritual principles. When Peter was preaching, basically he was yelling to the crowd, fire, fire, get out while you can. This is an emergency. Or as Luke records Peter's words in Acts 2.40, and with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So salvation from eternal destruction, this is what the Bible is really about. The coming of Jesus and his death and resurrection and everything that has happened since is the story of God saving man. So my question therefore focuses on the how. How is one saved? Because in the passages that I just read, it would seem that there are a variety of ways to be saved because the Bible, and I read the passages, says, well, you're saved by faith. And then it says, well, you're saved by calling on Jesus' name. Well, wait a minute, you're saved by the gospel? No, you're saved by grace. Wait a minute, Peter says, you're saved by baptism. So which is it going to be? This has led to some confusion among Christians who have completely focused on one of these statements and made out of it some kind of exclusive doctrinal position. For example, we are saved by faith only. No need for anything else. Our evangelical friends focus on this particular message. This is their message. Another message, well, because grace saves, 
then all men, no matter what their faith is, are saved. This is called pluralism or universali, uh, universalism. It means all roads lead to God. God is so good, God is so gracious that everybody gets to heaven, no matter what faith you have, no matter what position you have. And then there are some that focus specifically on baptism. Well, you're saved by baptism. Therefore, the ritual of baptism must be done correctly. This is called sacramentalism. And our Roman Catholic friends practice this. And even some in the churches of Christ practice this idea about baptism having to be done very, very correctly or else you know, every, everything, is, everything is wasted. Well, I believe that each of these things mentioned in the Bible in connection with salvation are equally necessary and important because all of them are from God. Now the way to answer the question, saved by what, therefore, is to understand the proper role of each of these elements in their relationship to our salvation. So in the rest of this lesson this morning, I'll try to do that very thing. Let's begin in Ephesians 2 verse 5. Paul says that we have been chosen, excuse me, he says that we've been saved by grace, but let's read the entire passage to put this expression into proper context. He says, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So when Paul summarizes and he says that God's grace has saved us, what he's talking about is motivation, the impulse, the character trait, the motivation behind all the activity that has taken place that eventually saves us is God's grace. Paul describes not only the nature of God's grace, but also other things that his grace moves him to do in this passage. For example, he says in verse four, grace is rich in mercy, is full of love. In verse five, grace does raise Christ. Grace does give life, verse five. And then more things he says in this passage, grace does save us, verse five. Grace does seat us with Christ in heaven, verse six. Grace does use us as an example of God's love, verse seven. Grace does create us anew, verse 10. So we can say that grace is the reason God does what he does. He is full of grace, meaning full of mercy and kindness and love. Therefore, we are saved by his grace in the sense that if it wasn't for his mercy and love, there would be no effort to save sinful, disobedient mankind. Now, the most popular catchphrase about salvation is, we are saved by faith. This idea is often repeated by Christ and the apostles. For example, Jesus says to the woman who anoints his feet with perfume and her tears, what does he say? Your faith has saved you, go in peace. Luke 7 uh, verse 50. And then Paul says that the Ephesians were what? They were saved uh, through faith, Ephesians 2, 8. So how do we reconcile the idea that we're saved by grace and then in other passages it says we're saved by faith? Well, one is the motivation to offer salvation, that's grace. 
God offers salvation because of His grace. This is how salvation is by or from grace. The other faith is the sinner's response to God's offer of salvation. The New Testament writers spoke of this in various ways. For example, belief as opposed to disbelief. You know, in Mark 16, 16, it's not here, but it's a, a favorite verse. You know, those who believe and are baptized will be saved, and those who disbelieve will be condemned. Here the idea is that God offers salvation to whom? Well, only those that believe, because disbelievers are not eligible to receive salvation. And then they argue in the Bible, faith as opposed to works. This is Paul's argument in Romans 3, 21 and 22, which is on the screen. It says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction. So Paul wrote extensively about this in Romans, in Galatians, uh, and in Ephesians, where he compacts his argument by simply saying that we're saved by faith, but what does he mean? When the Bible says saved by faith, it refers to the response that God is looking for in those who will be saved. For example, man cannot receive salvation by earning it through good behavior or through religious practice. He cannot receive it through knowledge or discernment or meditation or personal transformation. The only way to receive salvation is through faith. In other words, through trusting belief. So when the New Testament writers make references to salvation by faith, they are indicating which method God has commanded that this gift of salvation be received by sinful lost mankind. There's no argument in the Bible about faith versus baptism. That, that's a made up argument in today's religious world. The argument that they had in the Bible was faith versus works. Which way could you be saved? And so salvation made possible by God's grace is received by man on the basis of faith. That's what it means when you say saved by faith. All right, so, so far we've talked about things that we cannot actually see even though they are real. In other words, you can't see God's grace, you can't see man's faith, even though each are very tangible things. You can tell when there is no grace or no faith, even if you cannot see them. For this reason, God provides visuals, physically perceived things to enable us to see and express things that are real but unseen. He could have extended his grace to us with his word only. You know, an, an angel could have come down and did some miracles and then proclaim, okay, everybody believe and you'll be forgiven and you'll be saved. He could have done that. But he provided an unmistakable physical manifestation of his love and mercy, quote, grace, in the cross of Jesus Christ. The Son of God comes in a physical body and dies on the cross as payment for our sins. This is history. This is real. This is documented. John the Apostle captures the immensity of this act in John 3.16 when he says, for God so loved the world, grace, that he gave his only begotten son, the cross, that whoever believes in him, salvation by faith, shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so everything in the Bible from creation throughout the entire Old Testament, through the four gospels, all the people, all the wars, all the stories, all the prophecies, the poetry, the genealogies, the miracles, the parables, all of it is to prepare and explain this one event. The cross of Jesus Christ 
is the physical manifestation of God's grace. An undeniable act of love and mercy towards sinful man that offers salvation. This is why we also say that we're saved by Christ or we're saved by the cross of Christ. Different ways of saying the same thing. These expressions all refer to God's grace and what that grace sacrificed in order to produce our salvation. Now, the response of faith that God requires to receive that salvation also has a visual. It also has a physical manifestation given to us by God. That manifestation is baptism. Now there are many things that Christians do to express their faith in Christ. James, for example, says that faith without good deeds is dead, James 2, uh, 17. But, and this is an important but, but for the unbeliever who is called by God through the gospel to believe in Jesus Christ, his turning from unbelief to belief is expressed in baptism. Isn't this what Jesus says in Matthew 28 to go preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations? How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Already mentioned Mark 16, 16, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. The unbeliever's transformation from being dead spiritually to being reborn is seen visually in baptism. In Romans chapter six, Paul explains this. He says, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. And so the unbeliever's renunciation of the world and its values and its systems and his identification with Christ and the power of his character and spirit are announced to the world in baptism. Galatians 3, Paul says, for you are all sons of God. How? Through faith in Christ Jesus. Watch now, he says, for all of you who were baptized, there's the visual of faith, all those of you who were baptized, immersed into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. And so the unbeliever now appeals to God through Christ for forgiveness, for cleansing, for a clear conscience, not through self-denial, not through good works, not through law keeping or religious exercises. He appeals to God through faith in Jesus Christ and that appeal is plain to see in baptism. And this is where Peter comes in when he says, corresponding to that baptism now saves you. How? It's the physical expression of your faith in response to God's grace. You know, the apostles, the, 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 the New Testament writers, they didn't write everything they knew about a topic every time they mentioned the topic. Because if they did that, the Bible would be like this thick. So they compress ideas into just a few words and this is what Peter is doing here. He says, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. This is not just taking a bath, he says. What it is is significant. It is a physical manifestation of what? An appeal to God for a good conscience. And what gives it power? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because I believe in the resurrection, I physically manifest my faith. And in doing so, I appeal to God for a good conscience, which is what? Which is another way of saying, for salvation. Someone always asks the question, can you be saved without being baptized? And what is interesting about that question is that it does not appear in the Bible. <laughs> Nobody in the Bible ever asked this question, no one. No sinner, no unbeliever, no heretic, nobody ever asked this question. This is a modern question, all right? I call it a non-question. The Bible answer to that question is no. Why? There is no salvation 
without the cross. Correct? Amen? Yeah. And what is the cross? It is the physical manifestation of God's grace. There's no salvation without the cross. Therefore, there is no salvation without baptism. Why? Because it is the physical manifestation of the response of man to God's grace. We call that faith. God could have sent an angel, as I said, to do miracles and to proclaim salvation, but he didn't do that. He sent Jesus to the cross. God could have said, just say yes to Jesus in your heart, but he didn't. He sent the apostles out to do what? To baptize all those who believed. Baptism, therefore, does not eliminate or minimize or replace faith. It manifests our faith according to God's command. And I add this little parenthetical statement. If God said to me in the Bible, when you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, snap your fingers three times. Would I have to snap my fingers three times in order to be saved? Yes, why? Because the snapping of fingers does something? No, because God said this is your response of faith. And even if I was missing fingers, I'd figure a way out. So, yes, we're saved by grace. Because it was God's grace that sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay our moral debt for sin, thus producing the offer of forgiveness that leads to our salvation. So yes, we are saved by grace. But yes, we are saved by faith. Because faith is the response that God is looking for in us. Disbelief is what leads to sin and death. Belief is what brings us back to God. Our confession of Christ and repentance from sin are signs that the faith is bearing fruit in our lives. And yes, we are saved by baptism. Why? Because at baptism we leave our disbelief and our sins and our condemnation behind once and for all. It is the historical point where our transformation from unbeliever and lost to believer and saved takes place. A person hears about God's wonderful grace, all that God has done to save us through Christ. He hears this through the preaching of Christ, all the forms of it, and this news begins to produce faith in Him. Isn't that what Paul says in Romans 10, 17? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And this faith grows and develops to the point where it moves the person to acknowledge belief in the message, a desire to change one's life. And then this faith is fully manifested in the waters of baptism, where one offers his response or her response of faith on God's terms and becomes a disciple of Christ and a saved person on God's terms. That's the point. You know when I say it's a non-argument, is baptism necessary for salvation? That's a non-argument, that's a made up argument because it challenges God's word. It challenges what God says. It challenges what God demands. And you know, sinful men, ignorant men, they're good at challenging and twisting what God commands. And so I leave you to think about these things and consider Peter's words as he preached the very first sermon after Jesus' ascension into heaven. I'll just change the order for emphasis sake. He says, so let everyone know for certain that God has made this Jesus crucified, both Lord and Savior. That's who saves us. Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is how we respond in faith to the gift. And then he says, save yourselves, Acts 36 to 40. Imagine the inspired apostle is urging people, save yourselves. 
Shouldn't we urge each other and the lost at every opportunity to save themselves? In other words, if he thought it was important and urgent, shouldn't we? I encourage every person here, if you haven't already done so, to believe in Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God, and to respond to Him in the way God has commanded us to do so in the waters of baptism. I say to you, without fear, without embarrassment, save yourselves from the judgment to come. If you need to respond to my invitation this morning through the preaching of this uh, sermon, then I encourage you to come forward and uh, confess Christ, be baptized. If you need more information, if you've heard something that makes you think about baptism or faith, we have elders, we have ministers, we have one more than I thought we had this morning. <laughs> so please make your questions, your doubts, your desires known as we stand and as we sing the song that Bobby has chosen for our encouragement. Let's stand and sing, please.